Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to Well, I'm glad that you're joining us online if you're with us. Certainly, I'm glad that you're here uh, as we begin this new series. I was thinking this week about a couple years ago, not long ago, Sharon and I did a tour of Richmond. I don't know if you've done one of those. It's a bus tour. Uh, I was in Richmond at a conference, and somebody said, hey, why don't we take uh, one of our days and do this tour? He's, he lived there. And um, I like Richmond. Let me just say right up front, I'm not a big fan of, like, city bus tours anyways, um, but uh, Richmond is Richmond. You know, it's a nice city. I like to be there, but I'm not sure I would do a whole day bus tour. And so I was kind of on this, and Sharon and I are in the back of the bus, and, you know, well, this building is the building of commerce. And I just, and just we just, and this guy was going on a spiel. We're in the back of the bus, just kind of, there's not a lot of stops, and we start, like, falling asleep. There were a few stops, like bathroom breaks, and when we'd get off, at first the guy started teasing us. You know, we'd get off the bus, and he'd go, I hope you're enjoying your rest. I hope you're enjoying your sleep, you know. <laughs> well, don't take it personally, sir, da, da, da. You know, so I started wearing my sunglasses. Hopefully he wouldn't notice my head nodding. <laughs> well, the best part of the tour, for, for really for Sharon and I, was the, uh, which doesn't, will not surprise you once, once I told you kind of how exciting this, this, uh, this trip was, was the best part of the whole bus tour was the cemetery you know the, the uh, uh, it's hollywood cemetery there's like all there's some presidents that are buried there there's all this history there's presidents of the united uh, of uh in government but also of universities there's you know governors of virginia like six governors of virginia are buried there there's some famous musicians and and scientists and there's pastors and bishops and all and and back in because it's so old back in the day you know they used to like write like inscriptions on their tombstones it's not like just so you know nowadays it's just your name and like you know when you were born and you're dead and a little dash that's about it you get a dash well before the dash they actually like wrote a little bit about you and so we would go from tombstone to tombstone and read these inspiring stories about people who had lived before us. And it kind of gets you excited a little bit like, hey, this is my time. I want I to use my time and do something with, with, my, with my life. You know, that makes, it, that makes a, a difference. And it can be inspiring when you think about it like that, when you think of people that have gone before us that have done great things, you know, they, that's why we read, you know, these biographies and it can, it can inspire us. Well, that's what we're going to do in this series. This series, we're looking at the, the giants of faith. And we're, we're going to look at uh, a particular guy, Isaiah, today. But each, each week, we're going to learn from these people that can inspire us. They did it. They, they, they were just, the Bible kind of refers to them as heroes of our faith in Hebrews 11. And there's a list of them, and they're just ordinary people that got serious with God, and God did something big in their life. And he, he used them, and they made a difference. Now, I want to kind of start with this, this verse. It's kind of a theme verse for our series, and here's what it says there in Hebrews. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So, he starts out, therefore, which means whenever you see a therefore, you want to find out what it's there for. And it's preceding it in chapter 11 is the hall of fame of faith. 
and it's a list of ordinary people that got that made a commitment to Jesus, made a commitment to God, and God changed their life, and some great things happened. So there's a list of them. And he says, and, and I mean, there's like Noah and Abraham and Moses and Joshua, all these great people, right? And then he says, therefore, and I don't know if you noticed it, he says that their witnesses, he goes, since there's such a great cloud of witnesses, he just laid, and he just named all of these greats of the faith, and he goes, they're, they're watching us. You may have not known that. I mean, you may have never thought of it, but it's very clear here. They're watching us. They're like in the stands. They've got their pennants and their pom-poms, and they're kind of like, go, oh, man, because we're on this race. It says there's a race that's marked out before us. Run it with pure perseverance. So we're, it's our race. This is our day. We're alive. We're the ones running the race. They're cheering us on. They're our witnesses, and they're saying, you can do it. If you've ever been to... Uh, a football stadium or a big race, you know that there's stands all around and when everybody's cheering, you can't really hear individual voices, right? It's just the roar. All those, wow, it's, it's exciting to be in, a sta- in the stands with a lot of cheering, but all you hear is the roar. You can't hear the individual voice. What if on your race, somebody, one of these guys who had done it before had come out of the stands and did a lap with you. One lap, and they did did not a lot of time, just a one lap, and just encouraged you, shared with you what they had done that had worked, that helped them in their journey with God. Think that would help you? Sure. That, right, that's, and that's the goal of this series, that for eight weeks, we're going to have somebody come out of the stands, run a lap with us, and they're going to encourage us. Now, out of this, we will be encouraged. We'll be inspired to serve God more. We'll know our Bibles better because we're going to dig into it. Maybe you know a little bit about some of these characters, some of these guys in the Bible and gals. And we're going to kind of pull out some stuff that you probably haven't thought of. And so, as I said, today we're going to look at this particular guy. He's a prophet, Isaiah. He, we find him in the Old Testament. He actually lived about 750 years before Christ. So he's, he, he's back in the Old Testament. If you want to read about his, the historical part of his life, that's in 2 Kings in chapters 18, 19, 20, right in there, and how he interacts with some of the kings of his day, Uzziah all the way through Hezekiah. And uh, he had a lot of influence. Uh, and he uh, had a lot of prophetic words for kings and other people. And his, his prophecies were pretty um, remarkable. He, he, he's really the most well-known prophet today, mainly because his prophecies, well, he has 66 books. There's a lot of his prophecies, but also how accurate and how precise they are, particularly about the Messiah. I mean, he per- talks about the, the Messiah coming and being born and being born in a humble situation and, 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 and then about his, the release of his ministry, but specifically about the crucifixion. It's quite remarkable, actually, how he saw it with such accuracy and such detail, the crucifixion. I mean, John actually, in the Gospel of John, they reflect back, they actually say, Isaiah saw the glory of the Lord. He he saw Jesus. I mean, he saw it in that level of clarity. In fact, prophets of that day, there was another name for them. They were called seers because they could see. They could see things that other people couldn't see. The crowd couldn't see it, and so God would speak to them and say, just kind of show them and they would see it and then they would speak what they saw. And they would start to, they, they, would, they would change the world around them. Now, that's the person we're going to learn from. Somebody who has that level and clarity of being able to see. In fact, if I were to have a summary of all 66 chapters, summarize it in one verse, if, if, I think this is, if, if we were to ask Isaiah, just, hey, listen, Isaiah, uh, we're, we're in it. We're in a hurry. <laughs> Just summarize it all into one verse. Here's what I think he'd say. Notice it's on your outline. He says there in Isaiah 30, verse 21, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. He says that you will hear from God, that God will speak to you. You say, well, Andy, God, I don't hear from God. I don't hear God speaking to me. Well, he wants to, and he certainly will. It might be that you're going about it the wrong way. 
And so really what we're talking about today is, is your journey with God. What does it take for you in your journey with God to get a little closer, to, to kind of get through some of the fuzz, the confusion, especially if you're in a place of pain. Sometimes you're thinking, well, I don't, you know, I don't hear from God in this place. Sometimes when we're in, the most painful thing is, is when we hear from, you know, other people become our consternation. They frustrate us, right? Other people in our lives. We can't hear from God. We certainly hear from other people that irritate us. It's like the guy who um, couldn't hear. I mean, he had lost his hearing. He goes to the doctor. The doctor gives him all these tests, comes up with a cure. Actually, he, you know, cures his, 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 uh, his inability to be able to hear. After a few treatments, uh, follow-up treatments, he says, did you tell your family about, you know, that you can hear now? He goes, no, I haven't told them yet doctor goes, why? He goes, well, I've already changed my will three times. <laughs> okay. Was, here's a different one, okay? <laughs> couple, they're driving out of town. It's a, they're a married couple. They're not getting along. They're driving out of town. They're arguing about the best way to get where they're going. And they're going back and forth. It gets worse and worse. So finally, they just, they, you know, they go into the silence. They don't talk to each other for over an hour. Finally, they're driving by and the husband sees the, a donkey in the field, he, he, and he points out to his wife, he goes, hey, look, some of your kin is there. And she goes, yeah, on your side of the family. So, okay. Oh, wow, that's, uh, let's move on. I, I like to try to bring in a little humor when it starts to talk about pain, because, you know, pains, nobody likes that, right? I mean, it's hard. And when we're in a painful situation, when we're in disillusionment, when we're frustrated, when we, uh, when, when we can't make sense of things, that, there's an answer for that, G an encounter with God. An encounter with God changes everything. It really does. An encounter with God. And so that is, I think, what Isaiah would want you to have. And certainly we're going to look at Isaiah from that perspective on how God wants us to have this, this, uh, this, this uh, connection with God, to an encounter with God. You may have come to church. You've heard a message or two or three, and you've had an encounter with our church, and I'm glad for that. But you need more than that. Sharon and I didn't start this church 24 years ago so that you could have an encounter with church. Th that's not the way it works. We want you to have an encounter with God. Amen. This is what it's all about. For you to connect with God in your journey with God. For you to go forward and to take the next step. And so that's certainly what we're praying for. And uh, we want you to have that kind of clarity that Isaiah has. He can see God. He can see Jesus 750 years before Jesus comes. He can see the clarity of the, 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 the crucifixion. He wants you to be able to hear God and experience God in the same way. Here's some things that we learned from Isaiah. Number one is this. Our greatest pain, our greatest pain can be the catalyst to our greatest gain. It's when we're in those painful moments. God can use those in a, in a powerful way in your life. He can speak to you like, it's almost like he reserves things that he really wants to say to really connect with us for times when we're in pain, times when we're in, in, in difficulty. Now, here's the reason why that's so important. Because when we're in pain, our tendency, human nature, our tendency is not to run to God it's to run from God. That's when, when, when we're in pain, when we're confused, when we're overwhelmed, we often run away from God. Not to Him. But this is the time to run to God. When you're in a place of difficulty, that's when you run to God because God can speak to you in ways in that place in your life for some reason better than often any other time. This is what happened to Isaiah. Notice with me here in chapter 6. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, now this was a friend of his, he had a voice into Uzziah, and Uzziah was one of the, he was really the best king who had lived up to that point. But then he got into some sin, did some stupid things. He ends up uh, plunging the country into darkness and disarray, and he, then he dies. And so in, uh, in Isaiah's life, he's, he's at a real low point. He's thinking, uh, things have not looked any darker than they look today for me. But what happens in that moment of pain in Uzziah's, in, in, in Isaiah's life? Watch. He goes, I saw the Lord. He's in a place of darkness, a place of pain. He goes, God connects with him. I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. 
Above him were seraphim. Those are angels. There's different types of angels. These are uh, the highest order of angels. And they were calling to one another. Uh, these angels are shouting back and forth. They're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and threshold shook. Everything around them is shaking, but certainly he's, the imagery he's saying is, is even inside. He's coming apart. He's, it's something happening inside of him. It's symbolic. Everything inside me is shaking. He goes, and the temple was filled with smoke. So the glory of God is all around. So here it is. The God meets him in his greatest pain. His greatest pain. Sometimes it's in our darkest times when God connects with us. Then when we see God, we see ourselves clearly. Before God does anything else, God wants to do a work inside of you. He wants to do a, a deep, some of his, the, the deepest things that need to happen are in our soul. God, often we're interested in, you know, making sure our bodies are okay, we're eating well, we're exercising, that we're reading enough and, uh, you know, we're, we're concerned about emotional health, mental health, physical health. But you know, the top of God's list is you're, you're the health of your soul. How are you doing? And God wants to do a work in there. Sometimes people go, I don't know, I don't know about that. I, I don't think I want that. You know, I mean, just, I just want to, I just want to go to heaven. Don't leave my soul alone, God. But God's interested in your soul. He's interested in that. This is what he does here with, um, with Isaiah. Isaiah has this meeting with God. God starts to reveal some stuff. And look at what he says. He says, woe to me, I cry. This is Isaiah crying. I am ruined. Now, he says, I was hurting before with King Uzziah dying, but now, man, I realize I've got some issues here. He goes, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. So he sees his own condition. Now, folks, let me just say, if you want an encounter with God, you're going to have to allow God to do a deep work inside your soul. You got to be willing to let, let him do something in there. We often just kind of keep God at a distance. You know, the truth is we often keep other people at a distance. I mean, in our society, to, 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 uh, when, when you're at work and just out and about and going shopping or whatever, if you bump into somebody and they say, hey, how are you doing? They don't really want to know how you're doing. Have you figured that out? They just want you to say you're fine. You start getting into it, you know, like, whoa, go see your therapist or something. You got problems, you know, I don't have time for all that. Right? But the truth is we all have stuff going on. And so we need a place. I was talking to a guy this week and he was telling me about some of his challenges, his personal issues he's trying to struggle with. I said, listen, why don't you get involved in a small group? He was a guy. I said, get involved in a small group. I said, in a small group, that's a place where we can take our masks off. That's why we talk about Knowing God here in the weekend services and in our small groups is a place where you find freedom. Freedom, freedom to be yourself. That's what we're talking about. Freedom to let God start to do a work in your soul. See, we all wear masks. Right? I'm, doing it, I'm doing it right now. I'll just be, I, I am. I'm not going to let you know all about, I don't know most of you. I mean, like that. And you don't know me that well, right? So we all kind of wear masks like that. Well, I don't, want, I don't want you to know that kind of stuff about me. I'll just keep it so that you think I'm a nice guy, you know. But in a small group, they start to get to know you, which is a good thing. It, it can be scary, but it's a good thing because it's when you take your mask off, you go, hey, this is really what's going on in my life. And they care. And we're doing it together. And God starts to do a work in your life, not just somewhere on a mountaintop, somewhere by yourself, but no, through people. That's how God often works in our lives, working his greatest work inside of us. So that's part of your journey. You go, Andy, I'm stuck in my, my spiritual journey. Are you going to let God do a work in your soul? That's the next step. Then God removes our past so he can redeem, redeem our future. In other words, God wants to settle your past. He doesn't want to just focus on your past. He wants to settle it so that you can do what God's calling you to do. Now, maybe you came from an environment in your home or a church in your back, or some, some, some experience where you were always criticized. People only told what's negative about you. You haven't heard that God loves you and that he wants you to make a difference in the world, that he's, got, he's gifted you and he has plans for good and not for evil. 
And this is what the Bible says, that God has an incredible journey for you. He wants to do something in your life. And so, but sometimes we just, we get stuck because we're stuck in our past. We see our future through the lens of our past. And so you can't really, until you can settle the past once and for all. Hebrews 8 says that when we settle our past with Christ, that we have a clear conscience on everything that we do. It changes our whole perspective. This is what it says here for Isaiah. This is what happened. Then one of the seraphim, that's that angel, one of those angels came, goes and he gets a coal from the altar. It says, flew, flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. The altar is where the blood was shed to the, for, the, for the forgiveness of sins. For us, it's the cross. Jesus died on the cross. And when we put our faith in Christ, what he did on the cross, it, it, it's, that's how God settles our past. It brings forgiveness. And he says, with it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Now watch this. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. See, God wants to give you a clear conscience. He wants to atone for all of this stuff. He doesn't want you to be reacting to all of your past stuff in your life because it'll cause you to not embrace what God has for you. Amen. So you've got to be able to be willing to settle that stuff. Why is he doing this? To, why is he doing all these changes inside of us? Notice what it says, this next verse. It says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And here Isaiah says, Here am I, send me. Now this is Isaiah. He's just moments ago saying, Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. God helps settle his past and then says, I see a champion before me. I see a candidate to do something great in the world, to make a difference. Isaiah probably looked around. You do? Oh, you mean me. Why? Because he had settled his past. And so he steps forward. He goes, send me, I'll go. Send me. He stepped into God's adventure for him. The journey God had for him. You, got, you see, God won't make you do it. He's looking for volunteers. He's asking you, who can I send? Who can I send? And he will wait for you. And, but you'll never get there. You'll be stuck where you're at if you don't let God use your pain to, to uh, advance your spiritual walk, to be a source, a catalyst of your greatest gain. You know, if you don't let God do that work that he wants to do in your life, settle the past all that stuff's so important. This is what Isaiah says you need. If you're stuck in your spiritual journey, this is what you need. This is what I need. Now, I think that as we finish up this lap with Isaiah, I think um, looking at his life, he would say three things to us, three words of encouragement, and we'll close with this. Number one, I think Isaiah would say this. God wants to reveal more of himself to you. He's not done revealing himself to you. I don't care who you are. He... He wants to reveal more of himself to, to Andy. He wants to reveal more of himself. If you're on the staff of this church, he wants to reveal more of himself to you. If you're a dream team coach or captain, he wants to reveal more of himself to you. You see, when we get to a place of complacency where we say, well, you know, I put my faith in Christ and I, I, you know, I had a couple encounters. I, you know, I, I had, had God moved here and then I'm, I'm done. You know, and it's, sometimes people get that place in their spiritual walk. They're just like plateaued and they go, well, I've done that. I've seen that. Yeah, I got the T-shirt. I got the DVD. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, turn to your Bibles to, you know, John chapter four. Yeah, it's a woman on the well. I've done that. You know, I don't need to, you know. You know, there's nothing else God can show me is what you're saying. And I'm telling you, that will kill your spiritual walk. We, here's, here's what Isaiah would say. He'd say, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Everybody, we seek the Lord. Andy, seek the Lord. Staff, seek the Lord. Dream teamers, seek the Lord. If you're new with Christ, seek the Lord. That is across the board. Now, how do we do it? What's the key to seeking the Lord? Well, Jeremiah adds to that. He says this, a little detail, or in a condition. He says, you will seek me and find me. Now, here's the condition. 
when you seek me with all of your heart. Amen. So here's the key. The key is if you want to experience God, if you want to have this journey move forward, you want to do well in your journey, your spiritual journey, you need to seek God with, and you need to be all in. You need to be all, go all in. Some of you are trying to control your spiritual journey. God's drawing you. You sense it. And you go, oh, no, I don't want to get emotional. You know, God's drawing you, and you say, hey, maybe I should make a commitment. No, I don't know. I'm not good at commitments. I might break it. God's dry, he's, he's, he's drawing you along, and you just got the reins. Whoa, baby. No, I don't want to go that fast. No. Nope. Just probably, let's stay here for a little while. We, we won't even gallop, you know. We won't even w walk. And you're trying to control your spiritual journey. God wants to do some stuff in your life. Maybe you're afraid. Oh, gosh, if I, who knows what it'll do. He might send me to Africa to live in a hut. You know, he might, wh who knows what he'll do. I can't know if I can trust him. Listen, God has the, nothing for you that you wouldn't fully enjoy. He, he, I guarantee it, nothing for you that you would not fully enjoy with all of your heart. Because God is good. Our tendency is to think God is not good, right? We can't trust him. God wants so much more for you. He wants so much more for you, for you to step into that and to say, God, I, I want more. I want more. You know, some of us, we're holding the reins back in church, you know, and, and, and worship. You just come and, you know, and you're kind of like, you know, the music on and your, you know, your toe is the victory, but it hasn't made its way up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but the Bible says that we're supposed to be joyful in praise. I mean, we're, the Bible says, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. It says, lift your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. It says that we're supposed to dance unto the Lord. I mean, that might be a stretch for some of us, right? I'm not sure I'm ready to dance, but certainly, I remember when I was, I, I was raised in a, just as a kid, we went to a traditional church, nobody raised their hands, nobody was really involved, and, and then early on, we just stopped going to church, so I came to Christ when I was 18, I started getting involved in a church, and I saw people raising their hands, and I thought, whoa, what in the world? After a while, I thought, they seemed pretty happy, like they were pretty engaged, and then I started just noticing that I'm just as excited at a football game or something, but when I come to church, oh no, you know, can't be too excited around God. And I realized, oh, that's not really right. That's kind of hypocrisy. I thought, well, I don't want to be one of those people. So I, but, but, I, but I also felt really uncomfortable raising my hands. I thought, oh, I had never done that before. So I mean, I remember that I just thought, you know, this is the day I'm going to raise my hand. You know, and so I'm waiting for the right moment. I'm looking around, seeing if anybody's looking at me. And kind of right at the, you know, you know, there's a lot going on. I kind of just put my hand up, and put it down. <laughs> Whew. Practiced in the shower a little bit. Woo, in the shower, you know, nobody's looking. <laughs> my friend, God has an adventure for you. That when you start to get on God's plan for your life, you'll go, what was I waiting for? God has so much good things for me. This is what Isaiah would say to you. He'd say, go all in. Go all in. Number two, God wants to change you. God wants to change you. Why? Well, listen, the good news is God loves you just the way you are. You need to hear that. God loves you just the way you are. But he loves you too much to leave you that way. He cares about you. He has a plan for you. And he knows that you, he can't pour in all that he wants into your life without some things changing. And he cares about you. He wants to see you embrace everything. And he wants to see me. All of us need to change. Well, none of us are ever done. Notice Isaiah would remind us. He would say, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are crimson, they shall... Oh, excuse, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, that's a key. Now, see, there's a condition. Wherever there's a promise, there's always a condition. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land. So this is what it takes, being willing and obedient. Yeah, God, I'm going to do it. I want to be part of that. I want, I'm, count me in. And God can change you. 
See, our, the devil would say you can't change. You say, yeah, well, I don't, I, it doesn't look like it. I mean, here I am. I'm mean as an ogre. And my dad, he was mean. And my grandpa, he was mean. And we're just mean people. I can't change. You can't change. And there is something like generational sin, but there's all kinds of reasons why we end up behaving in ways that we don't, we're not proud of, that we know or don't really reflect who God wants us to be. So God wants to change us. He won't change you, but he changes us for the good, and he can do it. Now, how does God change us? Well, we're told here how God goes about changing us. For, we f see this in 1 Peter. This is, this is amazing. I love this. He says, like newborn babes. He's using a metaphor to show us how change happens. Like newborn babes. See, he's speaking to people that were being hard on themselves. Hey, I'm not changing quick enough. So he goes, hey, no, like newborn babes, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. So he goes, we grow like newborn babies. Now, if you've been in the church any length of time, you know we have a young pastor on our staff, Jacob Gaines. He just had a, a baby born on Thursday. So Sharon and I went and, and we're holding him right there. Little Kingsley, beautiful little kid. Now, Jacob's very proud of her, so is Aaron, but Jacob's very proud of her. And he probably is thinking she's ready to go into high school within a year or two, you know, because she's, she's highly advanced, according to Jacob. But no matter what Jacob thinks, that baby, like every other baby, is going to grow one step at a time. Once, I mean, that baby's going to learn to, to eat the, the, the food and then start to crawl and then walk and uh, just want, it, that baby has milestones like every other baby. And it's true for you in your Christian journey. So here's what, here's what the Bible's telling us. You know, if you, for your place, and it's really kind of cool because as a pastor, I get, the opportunity and the privilege to create a spiritual journey experience for everybody here. Some of you are newborn babies. Some of you have been serving God for many, many years. I mean, there's all ends of the continuum. And every one of us, though, have something in common in our spiritual journey. If we're going to connect with God, and here's what it is, take your next step. Take the next step. If you have never put your faith in Christ, then you put your faith in Christ. That's your next step. We don't need you to join the church. If you've not put your faith in Christ, we don't need you to find a place to serve in the church. Your next step is to put your faith in Christ. If you put your faith in Christ and you've been coming to this church for a while, then your next step is to join the church. If you've been a Christ follower for a while and you've not been water baptized, your next step is water baptism. And you need to sign up for that. Say, I'm, I'm ready. That's my next step. Don't worry about college classes or high school or whatever. I mean, that's my next step. If you've been coming here for a while and you know this is your church, but you've not served, you haven't found a place to serve, get involved in growth track. You know, and, and, and serve on a dream team. Take your next step. That's the key to spiritual growth. Take your next step. Everyone here, including myself, all of us have a next step. You take your next step. If you're going to grow and watch what happens, great things will happen. Okay, number three, God has an assignment for you. God has an assignment for you. Do you know why God wants to have an encounter with you? Do you know why God wants to heal you? Why he wants to touch you? in your soul? Do you know why God wants to change you? Do you know why he's committed to you and the process of spiritual growth? Here's why. Listen. Ready? Here's why. Because you are part of his plan. You are part of his grand design. His plan. He has no plan B. You are it. Now his plan works pretty darn good but it works even better when you're involved. 
He wants you to be part of his plan. He's got a plan for you, and it fits into his grand design. You're part of his plan. And this is good news because God, if, if you're going to break out, life won't make sense, see, outside of that. Because that's why, that's why we're here. That's why God reaches out to us. People try to make sense of life outside of that, and it's just confusing to them. And then when you're in pain, it gets very, very disillusioning. Notice what Isaiah says. He says, arise, shine. Arise, he says, take your next step. Move forward. Take your assignment. Embrace it. And shine. This world needs people who will arise and shine. This world is a place of darkness, a lot of discouragement, a lot of bad things happen, and life is hard. And, and the world needs people that, in, that bring with them the hope of Christ, the hope of heaven into your workplace, into work, into home, into your home, into all of those places that are so difficult. You're going through all the same stuff as they, they are, but you bring with you the hope that Christ is doing something in your, in your life and that Christ can do something in their life and, and, and life change. And there's, there's a hope of heaven and there's a, there's, a, there's a sense of God's using me. Rise, shine. For the light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Why? Well, here's why. See, he says darkness covers the earth. Well, we know that. And th a thick darkness is over all the people. But the Lord rises uh, upon you and his glory appears over you. Now, here's what's going to happen. He says nations, people we know, our family, our friends, our neighbors, all of it. He says nations will come to your light and, the, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. The world needs us to step forward. Vineyard Community Church, arise and shine. God would say to you, he would say, whom can I send? Whom can I send? And that's an invitation to us to embrace God's, the purpose he has for us. Last verse, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Why does God want us to know him? Why does he make all the efforts to bring his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross, to reach across the ages, to speak into your life? It's because he wants you to discover your purpose. You have a reason for being here. He wants you to discover your purpose. Now, we're going to close in prayer, but just take, a, I want you to just Take your stuff, put it in your lap. Don't just, we're just going to take a moment, right? It'll just take a second. But I want you just to take your stuff, put it in your lap. Let's close our eyes. Let's just, let's just, because some of you are in a place of pain, and I want to pray for you. Let's pray right now. In Jesus' name, Lord, I, 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 I invite your presence here. Some of you, you, the pain is so intense. The sadness, the disillusionment, the frustration the overwhelming sense of out of control, all of that is causing you to run from God. Today, God invites you to come to him because it's in our place of pain and darkness that his light can shine the brightest. It's where he can speak to you in a way that maybe all of the distractions that were there before kind of don't have the same allure, don't have the same grip on us. I believe God wants to reveal something in your soul to you. Because when we start to see who God is, we start to see ourselves properly, when we see God properly. God doesn't want us just to, he doesn't come in just to focus on our wrongdoings and our past. He wants to settle that stuff. Today, he offers you a clear conscience. You'll feel differently about yourself when you see it through the lens of what Christ wants to do in your life. God wants to reveal more of himself to you. If you're complacent, I'm calling you back to God. He wants to reveal more of himself to you. And he wants to change you. Because he's got a divine assignment for you. Would you pray, say, God, 
even in this place of difficulty and pain in my life. Maybe even you cause some of it. Say, God, I, I even might have a hand in some of this or all of it, but God, I give it to you. Speak, use me. Cleanse me. Would you say, God, cleanse me? Like Isaiah had that burning coal from the altar. That was a critical moment. That couldn't be skipped. And there's a moment in your spiritual walk where you need to come to the altar, which is Jesus Christ, where you need to say, God, come, cleanse me. Thank you for what you did. You shed blood for me on the cross. Say, God, cleanse me. Thank you, Lord, that you forgive all of my transgressions. Give me that clear conscience. You say, today, I want to follow you. Would you say, God, I put my faith in you today. Empower me. Show me your purpose. Help me to discover that. Help me to see my life from your perspective and your lens and not neg other negative forces that have been in my life for years. God can change you and he'll do it. Some of his changes are just divine power encounters where it just changes right then and there. Some of it takes a while. And what I've noticed is it's his discretion. Some of it, you'll need a small group to, to see the life change you're wanting. You say, God, I want to be all in. I want to be all in today. With your help, with your grace, with your power. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.